and where we can tell each other we love one another. And uh, yes. I love the order of worship that God has developed among us over um, a period of nearly 100 years now of root history of this people. <coughs> uh, in fact, we're now 101 years embracing certain tenets of teaching, preaching, worship, order in this people. I've been privileged to spend um, and remember very well uh, at least 75 of those years when I was a young boy just um, approaching five years of age my father was an elder in the church in Apalachicola, Florida very small seacoast town Hush Spring fishing town northwest Florida about 80 miles west of Tallahassee yes. and um, the church was the first church planted in the state of Florida of this water. A uh, pastor by the name of C.O. Dixon, outstanding Bible teacher, uh, became a very prominent minister, and his work remains uh, today, Pilgrim Temple. If you go to Oakland, California, you'll find a body of possibly 500 people, beautiful building, spacious grounds, that's Brother Dixon's work. He labored there on the West Coast before he died. An outstanding teacher uh, of the Word of God. And um, we would, uh, I remember him as a boy, and my father was an elder in that church. <clears throat> and uh, out of that church came three pastors, very prominent in the state of uh, Florida, uh, that uh, Brother Roberts uh, spent uh, probably 60 days in that church when he was a younger man, the man that founded this work, and uh, had some vital training under Brother Dixon. And then Brother Homer Harris, who was an outstanding man of God and pastored there many years. And then there's a work in Panama City that was still there. Gospel Assembly Church, I believe Brother Coy pastors that church now, and uh, that church is an outgrowth of that work in Appalachia. So this is some of the history of this people. We're not a new people that has just sprung up out of nowhere. We have some history. We have some standards. And we have some uh, things that we hold to very tenaciously as truth. And we don't all believe all the same thing, never did. That's one of the beauties of this order that yes. uh, when it was developed in 1912 by William Souders, a prophet of God, that knew he heard from heaven, he heard the voice of God. He's one of the few men I've ever heard say that he heard the visible voice of God thunder out of heaven to him, knocking him down in a boat. The impact was so great. The Souders was a police officer, and then he became a fisherman and a boat builder, a hunter. And he, um, when he was caulking the boat, the fishing boat, and some of you know what caulking is, mm -hmm. and uh, some of you don't. But uh, he was stuffing the seams of the boat and make it seaworthy. And the voice said, I want you to preach my gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And it thundered out like a loudspeaker. And the impact was so strong it physically knocked Brother Souders down in the bottom of the boat. He laid on his back and he said, I don't know how to preach any gospel. I'm a police officer, I'm a boat builder. And the voice said again, I said I want you to preach. My gospel thundered it again. And Brother Souter said, but I don't know how to preach like other men. And the third time the voice said, I don't want you to preach like other men. 
I want you to preach my gospel. And Amen. William Souders got up from that boat, went down to a revival meeting, Columbia, Kentucky, and uh, there uh, the power of God struck him, that man who had never known God, under a tent meeting and fell to his knees, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him utterance. And uh, they gathered around him, those early men uh, did, uh, the, the brothers who happened with that, those brothers, by and, uh, no, the, the, the brothers, one of them came to, uh, he was his brother Souter's apostle. Bob Shelton. Uh, Bob Shelton, yes. Bob Shelton and his brother gathered around him and prayed with him. Brother Shoemaker, Brother uh, Frank Knight, and that was the beginning of this what we have here tonight. So we're not a new people. And that from that inception, these churches were developed across the United States one by one, never organized by uh, literature, but strongly believing certain teachings. And uh, we were never a wish-washy people. We were never people that uh, were afraid to open our pulpits, something other churches wouldn't do and won't do. So we'll open ours. Ours is open tonight. And uh, we developed the open pulpit uh, to where ministers could walk in and, and uh, the pastor would relent the pulpit. Uh, to other men beside himself, an open pulpit. And Brother Souders developed that on the 13th chapter of First Corinthians, charity. Though I speak with the tongue of men, of angels, and have not charity, I'm, I'm nothing. It doesn't profit me anything. Um, I'm become a sounding brass and take them simple. Charity is the divine love of God that enables me to treat you in such a way, whether you treat me or not, the same way. Charity enables me to treat you right. No matter how you treat me, charity enables me to treat you right. See, because charity is the ingredient that became the foundation of our churches. And we taught the people, the ministry taught the people those early ministers did to get along with one another, to love each other, to forgive one another, uh, not to condone sin, but to bear with the brother or sister, uh, as the book of Jude said, and on some, have compassion. Amen. On some. Pulling them out of the fire. Making a difference. Uh, making a difference. Uh, see, so we, we understood that scripture. And the churches were built on mercy. And Brother Souders showed us the, the mercy seat, how that the mercy seat had to be before the judgment seat. Amen. And the Pentecostal people were judging one another so severely then, back and forth, back and forth, she doesn't have a long enough dress, he doesn't wear long sleeves, uh, he, she wears a too bright a color. Uh, it was bad. You didn't live back there. I remember it. I remember the judgment that was among God's people. It became horrible. It became to the point where self-righteousness took the place of the mercy seat. And the Pentecostal people became judgmental. He doesn't uh, wear a white shirt. He wears too loud of a tie. She wears an open-toed shoe. Uh, her sleeves are too short. Her hair is cut. Uh, his hair is too long. Uh, he wears a mustache. Uh, that, that took the place of mercy and the gospel of salvation among what was termed the Pentecostal people. And the prophets of God, the men of God, of the ministry, uh, they, they stood in the gap and Brother Sauter said, uh, let there be charity. Let there be mercy. God doesn't see as man sees. 
Man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And there was a wonderful spirit started working among uh, what was termed in those days the school of the prophets. Uh, in those days, we were called the school of the prophets. And there was a wonderful spirit. You could step into our church and there would be a red hot discussion on a Sunday afternoon, the word of God and gospel, the gospel. But yet after it was over with, uh, people would go and eat dinner together in the dining room and love one another and uh, cherish one another because the spirit of charity was put among us and taught among us and um, it, it, it started a work that then uh, was great and wonderful in its day. So tonight we're, we, we're not a new people. Uh, we have some new things. We have some changes and there's going to be more changes. And uh, there's going to be leadership. There has been leadership. And there will be leadership. Uh, the church of the living God has never been without leadership. Abel was the first leader God selected to build the right altar and offer the right sacrifice. God has never been without a witness or leadership and then God has never been without followers. Paul said to the Thessalonian church, but you were followers of us and the Lord. Uh, then in 1 Corinthians, he said, 11, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, so uh, God has never been without a witness in the earth. And God has been tempering that. Now we're down here in this 21st century. And here in this local church, we're trying to find our footing and trying to find the will of God and trying to find um, how not to go too far to the right or too far to the left, how not to stay in the old and never accept the new, and yet not fall for the new and reject the old. Um, we're, in, we're in a tug of war, uh, as every assembly is, and every pastor, and every church right now, because this is the time of the end, and uh, how not to be gloomy, but to be a happy church, how to be, how to be normal, happy. Happiness is normal with God. God wants a happy people. God wants a happy people, and happiness is normal. <coughs> Joy is normal, and yet at the same time, how to be repentant and sober, and um, how to think godly. It's a tug of war, and uh, we're, we're living now in this day where that was that day I described history, and I was there so I can vividly remember it, um, and now I'm living here in this day, and the same man that pastored a church uh, 57 years ago is still pastoring a church here, but this church is vastly different than the church I pastored 57 years ago. Uh, I, 57 years ago, I was over there, and the whole building was where Sister Leona sits, back to Sister Annette, and the pulpit was over there, and it was a sawdust floor, and there was no ceiling, and there was no air conditioning, and there was a big fan, and, and uh, Brother Marlowe was a young pastor. Uh, vastly different church, vastly different thinkers, vastly different people. That's a different conditions. Um, so now it's like a we're like a fighter in the ring that's got a new opponent. Uh, the opponent we have now is not the same in his actions. He's the same opponent, the devil, Satan, but he's not the same opponent in his actions. He's changed his style of boxing. The devil, Satan, the adversary, has changed his um, way. He saw he couldn't get the people of God one way. He couldn't delude them one way. He couldn't trick them one way. He couldn't deceive them one way. So now he's using different methods. Yes, sir. Uh, but it's the same. Uh, the Bible calls him that old serpent. Yes. That crooked serpent. Yes. That, that old Satan. Yes. See, so he's using now new things. 
in using new methods. Same, same adversary, but he went into training and he's using different tricks of the trade now to deceive, to uh, rob, to kill, to steal. Uh, but you see, the men of God also are not dumb. God called men are not dumb. Men that are called of God have intelligence. They, they, have, uh, they have capacity to think and to reason. And so the more cagey our opponent gets, the more cagey we're going to get. Because, uh, you see, we must deal with the adversary of this day. And um, the church must be alive and well now as it was then. We, we didn't have things back then that we have now to contend with. But we have a lot of things now. The media age. Uh, we have the age of our youth are completely different. Um, so Jesus, there's two things that remain the same to deal with this uh, crafty, wily opponent that Satan is. The word of God is the same. And the Spirit of God is the same. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Can I say that again? Yes, sir. Can I say that again? Yes. The Word of God is the same. Yes. And the Spirit of God is the same. Yes. So the more that Satan uses tricks of his trade to pull the church, deceive the church, work on the church, try to uh, move the church out of its position, then the men of God are just going to go into this. The elders are going to go into this. He doesn't have an instrument that can outdo this instrument. Don't give Satan credit. He's a liar. And this is not a lie. Praise the name of the Lord. Don't, don't give Satan credit. He's a liar. I call him a liar. I said Satan is a liar. Yes. Anything he puts his stamp on, anything he puts his hand on to try to trick you, deceive you, hurt you, bruise you, he is a liar. But Jesus Christ is the victor. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's give him a praise offering. Satan to know one thing. I'm nearing 80, but I'm sharper than I was at 20. I've fought enough fights. I've been in enough bouts. So that fellow better watch his footwork. I know where he's coming from. I'm wiser than I was when I was stood in that sawdust floor. And I'm going to tell you now. The church is going to emerge a victorious church, balanced with temperament and right with God, and the enemy is going to flee like he always has and always will because there's power in the blood, there's power in the word, there's power in the Holy Ghost, and there will be a band of saints that will be sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and will come out in the end. Praise the name of the Lord. There is going to be a glorious church. Praise the Lord. So we're going to receive our offering right now because I really I don't let the young people go. I won't let them go right now. But uh, we'll uh, let them go to their class. You, young people, I want you to have a tremendous meeting night with Brother Knopf. Harris here and Mr. Ben, your leaders here tonight. Uh, I want you to enjoy one another, but get your head in that word. Come out of there strong tonight. I'd like to see you at the end of the service. Come back in and be with us before you go home tonight. And uh, we're going to um, have a great night together. Listen to your leaders. Respect them. Love them. 
Um, we're working toward getting your youth building. We'll have it one day for you that are faithful to the end. And um, we love you. Hope you have a tremendous youth meeting tonight. And we're very thankful for our young people. Amen. They play a great part in our church. Let's give them a hand right now. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's, uh, young people, you got your offering ready before you go? Do you receive an offering down there, or do you, uh, do they get it here? Okay. Uh, I didn't want to take it, uh, if they were going to get it down there, but if they're not giving it there, young people, and the rest of you, I'd like for us to do this tonight. I wonder if we could make this a weekend offering. Now, to do that, you'll have to do more than you intended to do a moment ago. Because the normal Wednesday night offering is, ranges from $250 to $300, uh, $350. And I'd like to raise a weekend offering. And to do that, that means that I'm going to, and I have, I've prepared for it. So I'm going to give my weekend offering right now. And uh, you think about what your weekend offering would be and multiply it three or four times. And, uh, Brother John, did you say you had $500 tonight? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. He just, he just agreed. Us. So I, I Praise the name of the Lord. Um, get, your, get your weekend offering. Let's, let's make this a great, tremendous offering tonight. Amen. Brother Woodrow, did you ever find that uh, that great treasure that you were seeking? I'm afraid that you'll find it. And when you find it, uh, when you find it, put that hat on and those boots and bring it on down here. In the meantime, just go as deep as you can in your pocket. God bless Brother Woodrow. Amen. The Lord bless you, dude. Let's give a great offering. And uh, then we'll go on out in the world. Praise God. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Usher. Ready? All right. Ready?